everyone, and uh, thank you again for joining us for tonight's webinar. I'm Dr. David, and with me are Sherry and a very, very special guest tonight, Jackie Harvey. And she's going to be speaking about iodine and all war health. And really, Jackie, to most people, doesn't need any introduction. She's going to be talking. She has been doing quite a few webinars on hormones, which is extremely, extremely, extremely important. I mean. The fact that we've had her on so many times is really a testament to how important we think this topic is. And iodine, of all things, I mean, you would think it's not that important, but it's amazing how important this is. So without much further, uh, Jackie, you do, okay, Sherry, uh, Jackie, what you need to do is, uh, hang on, let me just pause this. Uh, okay. Sherry, are you recording this? Yes. Okay, great. Jackie, you want to click right there, just below the pause on the um, start recording. Which one? It's, 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 do you see start recording? There's a button just above the dashboard saying start recording. No, I, I don't have that screen up. Oh, That's David, the screen you that I have. You didn't. Hold on a sec. Go ahead. All right, folks. All right. Again, we apologize. We apologize. This is Dr. David again. <laughs> And uh, welcome to our webinar tonight. Tonight is about iodine. And without much further ado, over to you, Jackie. Thank you again. And I'm going <laughs> to change. I'm doing so many All right. Uh, Not a problem. We've had internet problems um, for uh, all, for the last couple of hours. So I hope that this goes well. If it doesn't, I will do it again for <laughs> Dr. David. They, they know that. Um, this webinar, I really believe, will provide kind of the missing piece for those who are seeking to balance their hormones. When I came across this information, um, probably about four years ago now, um, I heard a presenter, Dr. David Brownstein, and I was very impressed. I knew nothing about iodine, but for me, it, it sort of was the missing link. We wondered why some women and men could not resolve the brain fog for instance. We also wondered why some could not resolve fibrocystic breast disease. And we discovered that, in fact, iodine was the missing link. Now, um, I have a resource page at the end of this presentation. And uh, for those of you, I know that Dr. David will make this available for a very reasonable charge <clears throat> and fee. So if it interests you, um, by all means, um, uh, contact uh, Building Strength webinars for a copy of this, and you're, you know, I think that it will be uh, infinitely helpful for any practitioners that are on the line, for any um, of our Help for Hormones consultants, etc. We're going to cover a little bit of information on the history of iodine. I think that it's relevant to understand where the background for iodine has come from. Uh, we're going to spend a fair amount of time on talking how iodine uh, affects our health. I want to address the issue of testing and how to accurately test. Uh, you don't want too much iodine and you want, don't want too little. So testing becomes a very important um, and necessary procedure. How much iodine do we really need? We'll entertain that. And lastly, we'll talk about where to acquire uh, iodine. So I, I think I, I could ask just about everybody on this call, what do you know about iodine? Um, I know that most physicians know very little about it. Now, they'll, they'll know about the antiseptic properties of iodine. Uh, I'm going to quote from Dr. Miller. I actually have a number of uh, screen slides from him. He's the professor of surgery, um, of the surgery division of um, cardiothoracic surgery, University of Washington School of Medicine. So he says this, he's used iodine in heart surgery for the last 35 years. It is used to prepare the patient's skin and remains the best antiseptic for providing wound infections um, after surgery, for preventing wound infections after surgery. It kills 90% of bacteria on the skin within 90 seconds. So I think that uh, that's a, a very interesting point that maybe some of you on the line do not realize. But on the other hand, 
Um, most physicians understand the antiseptic properties of iodine. Most also will know the, uh, and understand the thyroid connection, that the thyroid gland requires iodine to make thyroid hormones. Now that's a, the, probably the most limited view that we're tonight going to expand upon in this webinar. So let's start by talking about history. Iodine was first discovered by a Frenchman um, in 1804, and he named it because of the Greek word iodes, which means violet. And of course, iodine is violet. When I bring up this, this will bring back school days on, uh, and remind everybody of the periodic table, uh, which is a table of elements. If you look over to the far right, uh, you will see fluorine, chlorine, bromine highlighted in red, iodine. And those are what are called the halides. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But those are the elements that we are talking about. And it's interesting to note that fluorine, chlorine, bromine are all in the same category. Uh, and actually, you'll learn tonight that they can block iodine, which is a little bit below. Halogens or halides, the um, oxidized version of uh, halogens, are really just a class of elements that consist of bromine, fluorine, chlorine, iodine, and acetine. We don't hear about acetine very much. These halogens, and this is an important point to remember, are antagonistic elements which completely block the absorption of iodine. And so what that means is if you uh, drink fluorinated water, if you swim in a, a, a pool that's chlorinated, if you eat foods such as or, or drink beverages like Mountain Dew or Gatorade that contain bromine, all of those halides will block your body's absorption of iodine um, and they're stored in your body as toxins. Chlorine is the oxidized form. Chloride is the oxidized form of chlorine. It's used in city water, swimming pools, uh, as a whitener and as a disinfectant. Um, my children are lifeguards, and so they uh, spend a lot of time in chlorinated water. And um, I'll share with you a story about one of my daughters who uh, tested her iodine level and it was sufficiently low. And we believe that part of the reason for that is because um, chlorine was blocking uh, her receptor sites. But chlorine is a toxic um, chemical and it blocks the absorption of iodine. We have to recognize that there are a variety of reasons why we may not be able to um, absorb enough or have adequate amounts of iodine. All right, let's talk about bromine. Bromine is used, um, and it's another halide, and is used in a variety of ways. I want you to note some of the ways. Um, uh, bleaching flour, for instance. So um, in flour, in rich flour, you're going to find bromine. Uh, furniture, carpet, clothing, um, preservatives, uh, in nuts and oils. Um, it's sprayed on vegetables. Uh, it's a fumigant for termites. Look at it's used in Paxil and Prozac, which are two very common antidepressants that are used by women. Um, and it, it is found in um, a number of products. I knew a gentleman who drank 10 bottles of Dr. Pepper a day. He developed leukemia. And I, I wonder, you know, if the excess bromine didn't, in fact, uh, wasn't a contributing factor to his cancer. Well, I mentioned these two, chlorine and bromine. Um, I, most of us are pretty aware of fluorine and fluoride um, as, a, as an ingredient, and I didn't want to get into too much of that. So let's um, move forward and talk now about history. Iodine, from its inception, um, moved into over the last uh, decade or so to um, 
being recognized as a medical treatment specifically for goiter. And if you've never seen what goiter looks like, there's a woman who has a sizable goiter. We, my husband and I were walking through a shopping mall um, a few weeks ago, and we saw a woman with a goiter that was probably three times that size. So we know that goiter is still an issue even today. Uh, and that is, it is affected by a, uh, a deficiency of iodine. In 1929, um, both the U.S. and Canadian government decided to iodize salt. And what that would do then would guarantee that every American had their daily requirement for iodine, enough to keep goiter in check. And that's the important thing to note. There was uh, really no um, really good science to base it on the amount of iodine that they selected um, as to put into salt. Um, the research that I came across, David um, Marin's research, was um, really interesting research. And before we end the evening, I'll give you a couple of great websites to go to look at. Jean Lugo um, discovered that bonding iodine to a mineral, potassium, made it water soluble. And so that allowed for the later discovery of iodine's antiseptic qualities. Iodine naturally dissolves in alcohol, but not in water. And until he made that potassium bond, uh, we weren't able to actually utilize um, iodine properly. Well, then iodine's use spread worldwide. And Lugol's solution was used between 1900 and 1960 by almost every physician. Um, and they were able to use it uh, supplementally for both hypo and hyperthyroid conditions. According to Dr. Abraham, Abraham um, of the Iodine for Health group, he claims that during the second half of the 20th century, um, people became idophobic, which meant that they, they feared using iodine because so much misinformation had been disseminated. I don't want to get into all the details of that, and you can look up uh, in his er, original document, the internist, but doctors became fearful of using iodine, and again, because of studies that weren't um, correct. So they were limiting the amount of iodine that people could consume. They knew they needed it, um, but the amount was in question. Well, then they believed at that time that it was so important that they, it was actually essential, they put it into bread. Well, that continued on until the, the fear factor came in and they substituted bromine for iodine. And I think there was more than fear. There could be some dollars in there as well. So currently in the United States and Canada, bread contains a bromide form um, instead of an iodide form uh, of a halide. Now, interesting to note, New Zealand and Australia in 2009 turned this around and all their bread except organic bread is required to ha contain iodine. So there is some move in the direction to understand that iodine is becoming more and more deficient. Starting in the 1980s, medical authorities um, all over the world, but United States and Europe particularly, established an RDI, and it was a, uh, an RDI that they, they believed was appropriate. Um, it was the RDI that would represent the body of a small animal instead of a large human, but this is, was enough um, that it helped to keep goiter at bay. All right. Well, sound science means that we, we look at down through the ages. And, and then, you know, iodine was classified as the universal medicine. Um, as we get into the 1960s, 1980s, where they set aside a particular amount of iodine per day, um, in 1993, Dr. W.A.R. Ghent reported that there were beneficial effects using higher doses of iodine, and they were doing research on that. Since then, Dr. Abraham has initiated the iodine project, and I believe that that is um, with Dr. Abraham, Dr. Fleckis, Dr. Abraham, Dr. Brownstein, 
that's a very worthy um, project, and um, I'll direct you to their website as well. So let's talk about the different kinds of iodine. Inorganic, non-radioactive. Some of you will have heard of radioactive iodine, but this is inorganic, non-radioactive. The Ki, SSKI, these are all forms of Lugol solution. Tincture of iodine, um, that's what they uh, put on uh, as an antiseptic, etc. Iodorol is another version. Then there is the organic form. Now, you know, some of you might think that why do we like the inorganic, whereas the organic ordinarily would be the better form? Well, the organic is primarily, number one, what is produced in your body, um, and the uh, inorganic is not produced in the body, but it is produced so that it matches the body's chemical structure. And then, of course, under organic, we have synthetic. Amiodarone, uh, and I will be speaking about amiodarone, is an, uh, given for arrhythmia, heart arrhythmia, and then they have the radio contrast dye that is used um, as well for, for the thyroid. And then, of course, there's the inor inorganic uh, radioactive isotopes. Let's talk a little bit about why we need iodine. Uh, Dr. Abraham, in his, on his website, Iodine for Health, uh, and we would agree with him, says that every cell in the body uh, contains and utilizes iodine. Um, white blood cells, for instance, cannot effectively guard against infection without adequate amounts of iodine. And iodine then is concentrated in the glandular system. And those three statements are absolutely true. And when you combine that with the fact that we're seeing today um, a, a huge development in a deficiency issue, when people are tested to see if they have sufficient iodine, 90% were found to be tested as insufficient. Understand that iodine is depleted by the halides, the other halides. Now, the only distinction here, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, all will displace iodine in the body. So if you're swimming in chlorinated water and uh, it, those uh, chlorine, chlorine um, ions could be coming into your cells instead of iodine. Uh, and if you don't have enough iodine, certainly the fluorine, chlorine, bromine will come in. The same thing is true for thyroid hormone. I'll be talking a little bit more about that later, and certainly is true of pesticides. All right, when a person ingests iodine, in this case, um, the person was um, given by injection, um, this iodine, uh, it, and this is called a total body skinty fan, um, but this woman was given an injection of radioactive iodine and was monitored 30 minutes at 6 hours and at 20 hours, and it shows all the places where, um, where iodine will locate itself. And I, I thought it was interesting to note at 6 hours, it's primarily in the salivary glands, the mammary glands, the stomach mucosa. And as, as it slowly dissipates, you can see where it concentrates itself. So not just in the thyroid, and I, I think that that's the important thing to recognize. I wanted you to, to understand that um, the ovaries, the, the skin, the, the brain, the uh, articular system, um, all the vascular system, the skeletal system, all of it requires and will have some iodine. How much is taken up? Well, the body requires about 6 milligrams a day for the thyroid, about 5 milligrams a day for breast and breast tissue. Uh, larger women or women with larger breasts will have an increased requirement. Um, men have smaller breasts and a lower iodine requirement. And then about two milligrams a day um, goes to the adrenals, the ovaries, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, et cetera, and skin, et cetera. Now, it's interesting to note that this totals about 13 milligrams a day, and that's what the average Japanese person uh, takes in in the course of their day. Um, and so people in North America aren't getting anywhere close to this. We're getting micrograms and not milligrams. 
for iodine. What are some of the conditions that have been established uh, that are responsive to iodine? Well, fibrocystic breast disease certainly is. There, we, we have noted, uh, according to Dr. Fleckis, uh, an incidence with polycystic ovarian syndrome, so we see that connection as well. And we've been personally doing testing with both these two classes of women and see that they, they really do have low iodine stores. Hypothyroid and hyperthyroid, of course, both cases, uh, iodine is necessary, and I'll show you why in just a little bit. Brain fog uh, responds very well. Diabetes, apparently, uh, certainly arrhythmias do, and um, as a breast cancer prevention. There's a group called the Breast Cancer um, Choices.org group, and they're doing research on um, intervention with iodine. Some of the possible conditions that respond to iodine supplementation would be hypertension, certainly cardiovascular disease, again, brain fog, breast cancer, and liver dysfunction. So let's talk about iodine and the cardiovascular system. I'm not going to go over each one of these systems, but I wanted to bring three or four to the forefront so that you could see what's going on there. Um, first of all, this is a study of 42 patients with cardiovascular disease. Um, 16 males and, uh, were investigated and, uh, to see if, they, if iodine insufficiency plays a role. And what they concluded is that iodine supplementation absolutely may prevent the worsening effect of iodine deficiency on cardiovascular disease because those with the most decreased urine iodine concentrations um, in the, detected in the subgroup uh, with arrhythmia and cardio um, and, and congestive heart failure, they had the mo most decreased urine as well for iodine concentration. So low iodine stores in people with arrhythmias and congestive heart failure. Um, and so we're, we're starting to see more and more. Here's another one. Iodine supplementation may be the missing link. Um, this is a health alert from June uh, 2006. So this isn't new information. Basically, they're all saying the body needs adequate stores of iodine for the heart to beat smoothly, in other words, to not have a severe arrhythmia. And um, this Dr. West uh, has been using iodine uh, in his own practice and suggests that um, he can attest to the fact that using iodine fulfillment therapy um, works for cardiac patients. This is relatively new. I'm pretty confident. I know that um, our own doctor doesn't know anything about this. So this is relatively new information, but it's been out there for a few years now. Amiodarone, I want to talk about that. Amiodarone is um, a drug that's given for heart arrhythmia. Um, it has tremendous side effects, but um, basically it's a toxic form of sustained release iodine. Um, Dr. Abraham noted that if, if when you give amiodarone and you bring the body's accumulated iodine levels up to approximately 1.5 grams of iodine, then the body starts to heal um, and the arrhythmia goes away. And his note is that this is exactly the amount of iodine retained by the human body when their iodine is sufficient. Now the problem with amiodarone is that it produces tremendous side effects. and um, you know, it has uh, problems with the cornea, um, nausea can cause anorexia, it has, there's a photosensitivity uh, with the skin. You actually, the people that use it, if they sit out in the sun, can turn blue. Um, some neuro neurological problems, lots of dreaming and um, disorientation that way. Uh, it does uh, contribute to thyroid dysfunction and, of course, displaces your own body's um, any iodine that you're taking in. Amiodarone may not be the, the appropriate uh, drug of choice for somebody with arrhythmia. Uh, they might want to consider evaluating their iodine stores and using just a regular amount of iodine. The other problem with amiodarone is they give a 20 gram dose. It's just a huge hit to, um, to the body instead of smaller dosing and looking for sufficiency. Let's talk about iodine and the thyroid. Um, there's no question that iodine deficiency is directly connected um, with 
a, a thyroid that doesn't function well, whether it's hypo or hyper, whether it develops, and, and goiter develops, and goiter develops because the thyroid is trying to work hard to produce um, the thyroid hormones that it's supposed to. It's not unlike the heart that enlarges under stress that is trying to pump blood through, and enlarged heart is a sign that it's been having a difficult time. Well, the same thing with the thyroid and goiter. Goiter enlarges when it's under stress and the, the body's trying to produce appropriate thyroid hormones. The thyroid gland produces two hormones. It produces T4 and T3. T3 is the active form of the hormone. Um, and the cells take up T4. What they do is then remove one of its iodine atoms because the 4 and the 3 stand for the amount of iodine. And so the 4 gives up one of its iodine um, atoms and it then converts to T3. In order to cause that conversion or to contribute to that conversion, the body needs iodine. And what's happening out there is a lot of men and women will go and have their thyroid checked. Well, what the, the doctor will do, he will check the TSH levels. That's basically checking to see whether your brain is working because thyroid stimulating hormone does not tell you actually how much thyroid hormone is circulating in the bloodstream. But when they um, find out that the T4 is, uh, or, or the TSH is high, then they'll want to give some T4. They're, the doctors then are assuming that the T4 is going to convert to T3. And truly, that is an assumption. Unless a person has adequate iodine stores, that may not take place. So I meet a lot of women, for instance, that have been diagnosed as low-functioning thyroid. They're hypothyroid. They've been put on Synthroid, which is 100% T4, and they're still not feeling better. And I believe that one of the reasons for that is because they have low iodine stores. Their body is not capable of converting that iodine. Well, women and, and men on uh, thyroid hormone replacement have to realize that now they've got a situation set up where they're competing against the iodine stores in their body. And there are lots of people on thyroid replacement. I think that the elderly are gonna, going to probably be at highest risk here because I, I observed this with my own mother. Um, she's shrinking in size. And if the doctors don't appropriately lower their dose of thyroid hormone, they're going to end up with hyperthyroid people. And again, that's putting them at, at risk for atrial fib. Um, their, their heart isn't going to work the way it wants. And it will also put them at risk for osteoporosis. Thyroid hormones and iodine. If you take a supplement of thyroid hormone, then what you're doing is you're inhibiting the ability for the body to absorb iodine. And so some people think that if their thyroid, if they're given thyroid hormones, that they have no need of iodine, but your body absolutely needs iodine to convert the T4 to T3 to be the active hormone that's used by the cells. Dr. Fleckis says that women who take thyroid hormones have a much higher risk of breast cancer than other women, and that's because their iodine stores are too low. Um, thyroid hormones double the risk of breast cancer, according to Dr. Fleckis, and that in risk will increase over time. And I know that some are thinking now, I need to get off of my thyroid hormones. I don't want you to do that. Um, listen right through to the end, all right? The goal is not to, to get off. The goal is to correct the imbalance. So these two points are important to make. And this is the um, Iodine for Health group. Um, and th they have a .com website that you can look at. But these are two statements that they want everyone to recognize. That thyroid hormone replacement does deplete the body's store of iodine. And they've proven that with a fluorescent scan. And it, it does increase the risk of cancer with long-term use. And of course, most people are told if you're going to go on thyroid hormone replacement, you're on it for life. Now, they recommend that all thyroid medications be used in conjunction with iodine. So if anyone's on this call tonight, what you, I invite you to do, if you're on thyroid replacement, if you're taking Synthroid or even Armour Thyroid, that you do a test. 
find out whether your iodine stores or where they are at, and then adjust the dosage and improve your iodine stores appropriately. Your thyroid hormone um, protocol will work even better. Even patients with no thyroid gland benefit from iodine therapy because it's needed by the whole body. Remember all the places that iodine goes. All right, let's talk about iodine in the ovaries. It is known that the ovaries concentrate large amounts of iodine. Uh, after the thyroid, probably the ovaries have the second largest concentration of iodine. Um, iodine deficiency then produces changes in the ovarian production of estrogen, as well as changes in the estrogen receptors of the breast. Now this is primarily focusing on women who are still menstruating, who have very active ovarian function. But in an iodine deficient state, research has shown that ovarian estrogen production increases. So we could see in these 30 and 40 year old women that are um, perimenopausal, an increase in their estrogen, and in fact that's what Dr. Pryor says we are seeing, while estrogen receptors in the breast also increase. And so that means that the breast tissue becomes much more sensitive to estrogen. Um, and that's not what we want at, at, the stage, at that stage where our estrogen levels are skyrocketing and increasing. Both of these conditions, according to Dr. David Brownstein, will increase the risk of developing a pathology of the breast that includes breast cancer. So recognize that iodine um, and the ovaries will also um, affect breast tissue. So that's the next point to bring up, iodine in our breast. Evidence-based research supports the possibility that breast cancer may be an iodine deficiency disease, amongst other things. Now this isn't the only thing, but certainly this is one category. And again, um, breastcancerchoices.org is doing a great job of researching this. But here's a few things that we've learned about iodine and hormones. First of all, it desensitizes estrogen receptors. So at the time when insufficient iodine is producing too many estrogen receptors, adding iodine will cause those receptors to desensitize. That's a really important point. It reduces the estrogen production in overactive ovaries. Well, under the insufficient iodine picture, our ovaries overproduce estrogen. Adding iodine causes them to calm down and produce just the right amount. Fibrocystic breast disease um, often responds to iodine, so we have to feel that uh, low iodine stores would precipitate uh, fibrocystic breast disease. And again, iodine causes apoptosis, which is cell death. And according to Dr. Brownstein and the uh, Iodine for Health group, it causes more cell death than the chemo drug does that, for which they would uh, treat women with breast cancer. I've, I've um, included a few studies that I thought would be relevant. This one is uh, from the um, mammary, uh, mammary gland biology and neoplasia. Um, and what they're saying is that iodine is the gatekeeper of the integrity of the mammary gland. And that would be for both men and for women. Um, so incorporating iodine uh, into your protocol to protect your breast in a balanced way is really appropriate. And the way that iodine works in this regard is as an antioxidant. Again, here's that uh, breastcancerchoices.org, and of course no spaces between any of that, but they consider the connection between iodine insufficiency and breast disease the most significant discovery that we've reviewed in the last 14 years. And I, I suppose part of that comes from the fact that there's really been very few revelations on breast cancer. And some of you will have noted when I did the call on breast cancer uh, in October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, that I alluded to iodine, but the fact that they have no cure for breast cancer right now is significant. Dr. Fleckus, in his own personal practice, says that he's seen the regression of cyst nodules, scar tissue, and painful breasts with the use of 50 milligrams of iodorol, which is the tablet form of Lugol solution, per day for two to three years. Now, some people want this instant um, turnaround, and what he's talking about is 
two to three years of, a of using a protocol appropriately. Okay, on mammograms, he's seen a 50 to 80 percent reduction in scar tissue present in the breast. Um, I, I would love to have some mammogram pictures, and um, I, I know that uh, I have personally experienced a reduction in the scar tissue uh, uh, in my own breast that's been viewed on mammograms. I'm a little reticent to have my breasts up on the screen. I, uh, perhaps I'll be brave some other time, but I, it's very interesting to look at the changes, the positive changes that just a little bit of iodine added to your protocol makes. All right, this I thought was a great study. Dr. Brownstein is currently doing studies. Dr. Fleckus is currently doing studies as well. So I, I really want to direct you to Iodine for Health um, website because I think that you'll see ongoingly more and more information. But he had eight women with breast cancer, 10 women without. Um, they tested the urinary levels of bromine fluorine that were excreted, measured at baseline, uh, one day after taking 50 milligrams of iodorol and 30 days after taking 50 milligrams of iodorol. Um, the initial iodine levels were low in all these women. What was shocking was the difference in the levels of the toxic halides. So I want to show you what he saw. This was what they saw with fluoride. At baseline, fluor fluorine is in the, the left side, and um, that's before they, t they added um, iodine and, and after. So the the amount of fluorine that was being excreted at baseline, um, no difference. After one day, the fluoride started to increase. And by 30 days, look at where the fluoride is. It had dropped down dramatically. So the body was excreting under the influence of iodine large amounts of fluoride. Bromine was the same. The bromine amounts that were being excreted under the influence of uh, fluoride, or uh, under the influence of iodine, was amazing. And it continued to, to um, increase. And I believe the reason for that increase, whereas the fluorine dropped, is because we don't have as much fluoride in our body as we do bromide. Um, there are just many more ways for our body to take in bromine. I think the other thing to note is that iodine displaces or ex causes our body to excrete mercury. So if there's anyone out there who's going to have their mercury fillings removed, they ought to consider a program of mercury detoxification that would include iodine. Uh, interesting to me. I hope it is to you too. There is a pattern according to Dr. Abraham and Dr. Fleckus. There's a pattern of iodine deficiency that we see. And so check out this pattern. First of all, in the thyroid, um, women and men will have, well, women particularly, will have cysts, nodules, enlargement of their uh, thyroid, scar tissue, and then ultimately cancer. In the breast, cysts in the breast, nodules, enlargement, uh, scar tissue, pain, and cancer. In the ovaries, cysts, nodules, enlargement, scar tissue, pain, and cancer. So they believe that there is a, a pattern to iodine deficiency. If you're experiencing some of these yourself, you might want to consider an iodine insufficiency test to see whether iodine plays a role in some of these symptoms that you're exhibiting. We don't want to leave the men out here because Dr. Abrahams, they haven't done a lot of research, but they, have, they are starting to look at the fact that ovarian tissue and prostate tissue um, come from the same source and that it wouldn't be inappropriate for prostate tissue and uh, ovary, ovary tissue to um, take in and concentrate iodine. So the, they're suspicious now and wondering, could the prostate be enlarging to absorb more iodine because it doesn't have enough? just as breasts enlarge when there's an iodine deficiency. And I don't know whether some of you knew that or not. Let's talk about the ways that iodine is operating then in these tissues. Number one, it's going to operate as an antioxidant. Number two, it's going to stop cell prolifer pro proliferation. It, it, it um, speeds up 
apoptosis, which is the uh, cell death, if you would. Um, and then lastly, it acts as a part of the production of thyroid hormones. And interesting, most people only know about the thyroid hormone production. Dr. Graham, um, uh, Guy Abraham says that he, he believes iodine is not toxic to normal cells, but it is toxic to cancer cells. Now, that statement has not been proven per se, but he's suggesting that um, taking iodine to sufficiency is going to decrease the oxidative burden and DNA damage in our bodies, and that's his suggestion. So such an effect, he said, he believes would be anti-carcinogenic for every human body. All right, let's talk about iodine and the brain. I found it most interesting, this study. 16 women living uh, in an iodine deficient area versus 11 women living in an iodine sufficient area. 10-year follow-up, ADHD diagnosed in 11 of 16 the women that were iodine deficient area versus none in the iodine sufficient area. Um, the IQ of the children was uh, sufficiently different as well. Higher IQ in children uh, with women who are living in an area where there is sufficient iodine. Now, if we understand sufficient is minimal, um, uh, it's not really an adequate amount, it's just barely meeting the needs for goiter. However, um, I think that this is uh, pretty interesting for for us to view children that are um, attention deficit and where that might have happened. As far as iodine and brain development, the role of thyroid hormone during early um, brain development, this particular study showed that mild to moderate iodine deficiency is still the most widespread cause of um, hypothyroxemia. Um, and, and you know, the, the thing about this is that a little bit of iodine, uh, as soon as the pregnancy starts, or earlier or better, resolves this issue. Now, granted, we're primarily talking about third world countries. We are now concerned that it's affecting North America. I have other studies that I'm, I, I don't want to go into uh, a, a lot on these, but I, I look at the conclusions. An improvement in iodine status rather than iodine status itself determined mental performance in this population, which was literally iodine deficient. Um, we, we don't, well, we are. We are going to be playing catch up with iodine. I'm pretty convinced. Um, a couple more studies. Uh, the iodine deficiency results in a global loss of IQ. Um, and I think that the ADD study showed that as well. Bottom line is, um, when it comes to iodine deficiency, we believe that it is the underlying res responsible um, mineral responsible for this high rate of cancer because of how it works in the cells in the body. Dr. Brownstein estimated then that 95% of the individuals that they, he has tested are deficient in iodine. That's a remarkable number, and he's tested literally thousands. So I want to share with you how to test. And I think it's important to test. Some of you will have heard about um, the patch, testing with the patch. Well, Dr. David Derry, who's a um, BC physician, has authored the book, Breast Cancer and Iodine, and I encourage you, that's a great book. Um, you can order it online as well and download it down to your computer, which is what I've done. But he talks about this tincture test, whether swabbing a bit of iodine on your skin is an actual accurate test for iodine. He says that iodine disappearance rate is unrelated to thyroid disease or even to iodine content of the body. In other words, the thought is you swab it on your skin within 24 hours. If it disappears, you're, you're, um, you have an insufficient thi um, iodine level. He says it's not related. Meticulous research has, in 1932, so that goes back a long ways, has showed clearly when iodine is applied to the skin in almost any form, 50% evaporates into the air within two hours, and between 75 and 80% evaporates, evaporates into the air within 24 hours. So it's not telling you anything. And so that test, although it's being touted, I've seen it all over the internet, is an inaccurate test for iodine. At the most, it's going to tell you what your skin needs, and you note 
that your skin uses less than two thirds of the or two percent of the um, or two, less than two grams of the iodine that your body needs for the day, about approximately twelve and a half um, milligrams of iodine. What is an accurate test? Well, the test for iodine insufficiency is a simple 24-hour urine test that can determine if you have sufficient levels or not. And you're more than welcome to go on to our helpforhormones.com website, click on iodine testing. We have a newsletter there that you can read about it uh, and that you have the opportunity to order if you would like as well. Basically, it's a two-step process. You collect a baseline first thing in the morning of urine, and they um, evaluate that or compare that with the 24-hour collection of urine after you've taken 50 milligrams of iodine. If you secrete out 90% or more of the iodine, then you have iodine sufficiency. If the percentage is less than 90%, then you are iodine insufficient. It's called an iodine loading test and you know so the principle is if your body's level of iodine is adequate then when you take in that 50 milligrams of iodine you're going to excrete most of it your body won't keep any of it but if your body is insufficient it will keep a significant portion um, of that dose it, it, it will retain it it will not excrete it into the urine so Iodine sufficiency is present when there's more than 90%. If it's less than 90%, it's to what degree you are insufficient. The test kits that uh, we provide from the lab uh, contain all the collection materials that you need. Um, they have all the instructions that you need. In fact, this is what a test kit looks like. Uh, results are provided within uh, 10 to 15 days, usually less than that. Um, and just so it's clear you don't send that whole orange jug back. You send the little tube that's marked one and two into the box um, and receive the test results, which look like this, within a short period of time by email. The uh, test results then uh, can be reviewed by one of our uh, Help for Hormones consultants. We'd be glad to, to do that. You can order a test from us and um, obtain a free uh, consultant review to help you with what do I do with the next step? What are some other things that I need to do? Again, you can visit our website. We have a, a really good newsletter on there that I would encourage you to, uh, to take a look at. So if our test shows that we have insufficient iodine, what are we going to do? Well, and really, how much iodine do we need? Well, according to Dr. Donald Miller, again, he's the, um, the cardiac surgery uh, professor at the University of, uh, of Washington School of Medicine. He says this about iodine, that we need micrograms for thyroid. That's a very small amount. He says, well, in fact, he says we need it in micrograms, milligrams, and grams. We need all of them. He said, uh, first of all, the micrograms for um, thyroid function. That's to prevent goiter, basically. We need it in milligrams to obtain optimal health, to get, uh, prevent or maybe even to treat fibrocystic, fibrocystic breast disease and to prevent and treat cancer. Now, he put civil defense in there because when you increase your iodine levels, it counters any radioactivity that's out there as well. And he's got uh, some really good information. I can direct you if you send me an email to his uh, civil defense presentation, very, very interesting, on radioactive material and how if you have an adequate amount of iodine in your body, your body will not take in radioactive material. In gram amounts, uh, treating multiple diseases, so skin diseases, heart, anything pulmonary, anything cardiovascular, or uh, something to do with uh, the fungal area. So how much iodine is enough? Dr. David Derry suggests that we need um, milligrams in, in amount. And he's using a dropper, so he's using the Lugo solution in, um, in liquid form. Dr. Uh, Fleckis, Dr. Brownstein, uh, Dr. Abraham have successfully treated more than 4,000 patients with iodine supplementation. Now, the only caution they make is that uh, excess calcium will uh, cause a poor response to iodine supplementation. So 
And you know, we've been talking for a long time about not supplementing, not over supplementing with calcium anyway. So what are the best sources for iodine? Well, let's look at the food sources to begin with. Um, all of these amounts are uh, appropriate. You know, iodine content of vegetables, fruit, grains, um, you know, they only can reflect the amount of iodine that was in the soil that they were grown. So most of this is uh, reflective of what's in the sea. Um, iodine content of North American soils is low and as a consequence, totally, you know, um, deficient low stores of iodine. And that's why in the 1929-1930 they iodized salt because of low stores of iodine in the soil. Um, iodine levels of meat, chicken, eggs, and dairy are also then reflective of the iodine content, content in the animal feed. And if they're not being fed additional iodine, if, there's seasonal, if they, the producer sees no value, then you know, even the milk and eggs aren't going to have an, uh, an adequate amount. What about eating fish? Well, fish won't give you iodine in the amounts that you need. Um, to get 13.8 milligrams of iodine, you would have to eat 10 to 20 pounds of fish per day. Probably most of you aren't up for that. And so, you know, the idea of can we get it in our diet, um, a quarter of an ounce of dried seaweed, provided it's a form of seaweed, not all of the seaweed has a high amount of iodine, but provided it does, would, give, would do that for you. But um, are you eating seaweed on a daily basis? So what are our choices for supplemental iodine? Well, Lugol solution is very effective. Uh, Dr. Abrahams noted that the research shows that, that the thyroid gland likes iodide, whereas the other organs, the breast, ovaries, etc., prefers elemental iodine. Both forms are present in Lugol solution. Now, the problem with Lugols is that it doesn't taste very good. <laughs> and that's um, an understatement. Compliance then, staying on a program, is sometimes um, testy at best. So we provide at Help for Hormones a tablet, very small, called Iodorol, that contains um, the right amount, a 12.5 milligram dose, of both iodide and iodine in the right combinations. And w we have had many people use this and test out very well. So the therapeutic protocol from Dr. Mead's lab, after testing, you do 50 milligrams a day for 90 days, retest, and then do a maintenance dose of 12.5 milligrams. And the maintenance dose is based on the Japanese, um, the, the fact that the people in Japan are consuming approximately 13 um, milligrams of iodine on a daily basis through the food that they're eating. Um, our protocol is not as dramatic as this. Uh, we at Help for Hormones usually work it the other way around where we start with 12.5 milligrams and slowly increase. Um, and um, I'll share in a minute why we do that. This is what iodorol looks like. It's really inexpensive. It would not, at 12.5 milligrams per day, it wouldn't cost a person $10 a month. So this is not an expensive uh, protocol to incorporate. What you need to do is find out whether you need it because you can actually take too much iodine. So what can we expect from uh, taking supplemental iodine? Well, these are the positive benefits. Um, lifting of brain fog seems to be one of the main things that happen. Feeling warmer in cold environments, well, it's supporting thyroid function. And so one of the, the main um, symptoms we know of low functioning thyroid is cold hands and cold feet. Well, that tends to change once you supply the body with enough iodine. Um, needing less sleep and sleeping better, sounder. Um, improved skin seems to be something else. And uh, again, um, an improvement in energy. So those are, you know, <laughs> very positive reasons for checking out what your iodine levels are. What happens in, from a laboratory perspective? Well, TSH generally goes down. If it's sky high, your body is trying to produce those thyroid hormones, is not able to, so TSH goes down. Um, the free T4 usually will drop down and the free T3 will drop down, but they'll stay where the T3 is being converted. 
The majority of patients, according to Dr. Fleckis, lose fat and they gain muscle mass. So there's added benefits there as well. Now, what some of you are probably saying, well, what are the negative side effects? Well, there is no been no uh, anaphylactic reaction reported, um, and there are some specific reasons for that. I would read Dr. Brownstein on that, and et cetera. So if people have um, an allergy to, to um, seafood, for instance, that's not an allergy to iodine, and they need to recognize that um, that's a whole different um, allergic reaction. So iodine allergies um, to routine dosages are, are essentially a myth. Iodine can cause a detoxification re reaction, and we want to alert people to this. Remember, it displaces fluorine, chlorine, and bromine, and that can have uh, effect on how your body reacts to that and how you feel. It could produce some fatigue or some muscle aches or a, a little bit of diarrhea, even an increase in brain fog before that dissipates perhaps even some skin rashes. Remember, when your body is detoxing, sometimes it uses the pathway, the kidneys, the bowel, and the skin for detoxifying. Um, so David Brownstein says that detoxification reactions are rare, but it has happened. And what it means is that you're spilling bromine and chlorine and fluorine from your body. You're actually displacing it with iodine. That's a very positive thing. So some of these things have been known to happen, but they dissipate quickly. And usually this happens when you use a 50 milligram dose. So we start and work it the other way around, 12.5 milligrams to start and slowly increase over the, a, a, a period of time. Stay on it until you get a test result that shows that you have sufficient iodine and then uh, drop down to a 12.5 milligram maintenance dose. Alleviating, allevi alleviating iodine problems. So if you are detoxifying, these are some of the things that might help. And I just tell people from the start, this is what you need to do. If you're going to add iodine, you are going to detoxify. So even though you don't show tremendous symptoms of detoxifying, do these things. Number one, make sure you increase your vitamin C. Vitamin C can actually help to repair the iodine transport mechanism that bromine impairs. Salt, making sure you take about a quarter of a teaspoon of either Celtic or Himalayan salt on a daily basis in a glass of water. And fortunately, what we've done is if you're using the vitamin C from, uh, from our um, source, we've added sodium to our vitamin C. And so this makes it it's sort of a all together in one. And so if you're taking a, a teaspoon of our vitamin C, you're getting 4,000 um, milligrams of vitamin C, and you're getting an adequate amount of salt at the same time as sodium, as, as Na. Um, because this, again, helps to repair the iodine transport mechanism that bromine and fluorine cause to um, become a problem. Exercise becomes important water and a clean diet, and making sure that you're not taking in fluoride, uh, fluorine and bromine. I'm not going to leave this slide up there, but if, if for those who, who want um, to get rid of bromine, all of this is up on, the, uh, on Dr. Uh, Fleckis and Dr. Abraham's website, iodine4health.com. Um, but just know that there is a flush that you can get rid of bromine. Now, this would be appropriate for somebody who really has uh, a toxic level of bromine. And I've seen it so much so that the nails, the fingernails turn yellow. Uh, they, they get rid of so much bromine. But that would also include using 50 milligram doses of iodine. And, and we don't, as a rule, do that. So in review, there's a significant history, both past and present. And I prefer to look to the present and to the future of what iodine might do for all of us. Iodine affects us in many areas, the brain, the cardiovascular system, certainly the endocrine system, um, very important. Um, testing is imperative. Uh, we believe in, in testing, not guessing. And then appropriately supplementing. If your test shows that you're deficient, then by all means, do something. Now, 
you've listened to this webinar. In the meantime, you know, test and supplement as required, but what have you got to lose? You know, basically you could reduce your risk of breast cancer, according to Dr. Abrahams. You could release heavy metals and toxins that are stored in your body, uh, mercury, for example, fluorine, chlorine. Um, you could reduce your dependence on thyroid hormones. Now, I say reduce because if you've been on thyroid hormone replacement therapy for longer than four years, even three years, your body becomes dependent on those hormones and no longer produces them. If your doctor has prescribed them, you want to work hand in hand with your physician. Do not go off thyroid hormone therapy, um, cold turkey. And don't go off it at all unless you're working in conjunction with a physician who understands this procedure and protocol. Um, you will likely get rid of some of your pain. That's another positive benefit. So what have you got to gain? Improved feeling of well-being. Increased energy. Um, most hormonally challenged women I talk about have problems sleeping. Well, iodine insufficiency might be one of their problems. Um, regular bowel movements. It's a form of detoxification. It's, we note that hormonally challenged women don't have normal bowel function. Uh, improved complexion. I, I, I talk to many, many women who tell me that they have had skin problems for a long time. And here they are, menopausal women, and their skin problems come back. We believe it could be an iodine connection. I'll close with Dr. Abraham's information. And he, he calls supplementation with iodine, orthoiodose supplementation. But he says that it may be the safest simplest, most effective, and least expensive way to solve the health care crisis crippling our nation. And truthfully, between vitamin D3 and iodine, I think that we can resolve a lot of hormone health problems that are out there. Um, this is my recommended reading list. I in, invite you to, um, to order this um, presentation where you can get all of this information. And David, I'm Dr. David, I'm going to turn this back to you for some question and answer time. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> okay, Jackie. Is it even possible you've outdone yourself again? <laughs> <laughs> well, th don't you I think can... this is interesting? It, it really is. I had no idea. I had no idea something uh, I mean, iodine from when we were grow when we were studying medicine. I mean, iodine deficiency was associated with. I mean, severe iodine iodine deficiency was associated with uh, major issues, but mild iodine deficiency were, was just like you just had a big um, goiter. You just had a goiter, really. Um, Correct. But, uh, this sub these subclinical quote unquote uh, symptoms that we're looking at. That is just amazing. Just amazing. Thank you so much again. All right. Well, you're very welcome. I think that this information, David, I, the reason I present this type of information is because I, I, I believe it can change lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe that as well. I believe that as well. Uh, folks, you can start, start typing in your questions. I wanted to take the screen from you away from you briefly, Jackie, just to do a quick uh, announcement, a quick couple of announcements. Remember, tomorrow we'll be talking about far infrared sauna, folks. That's going to be very interesting. Uh, and if you can see my slide, obviously those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is, this is um, Jackie's presentation on iodine for health. Now, you can actually, I know there are going to be probably more questions that we can answer tonight. You can actually go back to our site and you can actually click on this banner, banner with the same title. That will take you to the next page. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping here, but you can take, take the next page, and I believe you can actually, actually leave your comments and your questions there as well. I will be sure to send them to Jackie, and if she can't answer them, she will. No promises there, but she usually does anyway. Um, also on that page, now, uh, we have made these available during Jackie's last presentations, and I tell you, what a collection uh, of some of really the clearest and best uh, description of, of what hormonal balance is all about. Uh, this is a, a six uh, pack, uh, and each of them is at least an hour and a half. And let's see how long do we have. 
it's, it's nice to us, two hours. <laughs> that, that, that's pretty much Jackie, really. Jackie goes for about two hours. She's kind of standard. <laughs> I don't know how she does it. But uh, these are the presentations she has done in the past. Hormone balance, the key to, pre to breast cancer prevention, which was fantastic. As well as uh, well, Jackie, you know what? Why don't you just talk about them yourself so people know what to know what you? Well, I we I've done two presentations on, on men's hormones. I've done two on women's hormones, and then we've done uh, the one on breast cancer. Um, and also, uh, you're including in that uh, Dr. Mead's presentation on saliva testing. I, I think right. that we've tried to cover every aspect of hormonal imbalance and and as clear as we possibly can with identifying the symptoms, um, finding out uh, how to test and to test well, and then what to do with that um, test information. Uh, I, I, I really believe that, um, that this is a, a pack that uh, certainly every practitioner, uh, anyone who aspires for hormone health, you won't get this information anywhere else. Let's put it that way. In fact, a couple of the, the, of the men's presentations and the breast cancer presentation, and this one on iodine, David, are done exclusively for you. Oh, so wow. they won't hear it anywhere else. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate that. And, and quite a few of your consultants have already uh, purchased this pack. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think it was Charlotte who told me how she went, uh, she took the video to uh, somewhere far inside Canada where they didn't have internet connection and they played the videos for the ladies there and it was such a blessing for them to... They, they used one of the webinar presentations, yes they did. That, and the, is, it was that, at a health clinic, it was at a, um, a medical clinic or a health clinic that was um, uh, in, yeah, very far north <laughs> for most, especially from where you are. Um, and, <laughs> and the women there, the nurses that, that co-hosted it were just thrilled. I, I can imagine. I can imagine. I really think this, this information like this should be blasted all over the world because it's such it's of such such great importance. Oops, let me go back a bit. <laughs> uh, just and there's another one here that is not included in this screen capture, and that's the one on vitamin D with Dr. Owens, which which as you know, it's, um, you know her personally. I know, but that was well, and I asked to have that one included, um, David, because vitamin D3 is probably within the next little while going to be classified as a, um, a hormone. And so vitamin D3 as a hormone really becomes, um, you know, a whole different issue. It has really good benefit, um, cellular benefit, and I think that, as I said in closing on the call here, vitamin D3 and iodine make two really important additions to anybody's hormone protocol. Absolutely, and who, who would have thought? Who would have thought? So, and really, we like you, you mentioned, you you asked to add that to it, and really, we really made this available primarily to your consultants who do the the the, the leg work and taking this wonderful information to people. And so, we what we did is that for for six of them, we made them available for twenty five dollars. And you can actually go to go to our site, folks, and by clicking on that banner, you can get uh, you can purchase purchase those webinars at that cost. And this is only for those who have attended and have uh, regi registered for this presentation. Okay, so that's enough Here. of our infomercial. And we're gonna go back to the questions. I'm sure this I call, I'm gonna, Jack, let me just hand this back to you so that you can see your slide again. Okay, uh, so just accept that, there you go. Okay. All right, questions. Uh, what happened, just disappeared. Okay. I'll be with you in a minute. Let me just make sure I find the find the sorry about that folks. Okay. Aha, he was hiding there somewhere. Aha, as I guess. <laughs> They've been piling in while we've been doing doing the infomercial. Okay. All right. Uh, is there a specific blood test which identifies low iodine? Is, is, is it is the depletion usually located in the thyroid? I believe you covered this, but... Okay, uh, two questions, though. One is, is there a blood test for iodine? I'm not aware. Uh, it is my understanding that Dr. Fleckis and Dr. Abraham felt that a urine excretion test was a better um, way of testing. And, and let's talk about 
different forms of testing. All right, so um, I don't know if a blood test would show up iodine as accurate. Dr. Um, Abrahams, well, all of the, those physicians are, are medical doctors who use regular uh, laboratory resources. Obviously, they believe that there was a better test out there. When, you know, some people use, um, or the, the time to use saliva, for instance. Saliva is a really good sieve um, and, and actually uh, holds the bioavailable hormone that's, that's actively circulating in the bloodstream, but it also evaluates only the unbound hormone which is available to receptor sites. Blood, on the other hand, for hormones, um, holds both the bound and the unbound hormones. So in actual fact, if a person is going on bioidentical hormones that are all unbound, the better method of testing would be to use a saliva test. Well, when it comes to urine, if you're going to do an excretion test, basically the, the, you're setting up the parameter that you're going to take in something and you're going to see how much measurable that you can excrete. Very few times can you set that up, and this is one of those wonderful times that you can. I know that there are people out there that talk about hair analysis. I've never been that fond of it because you can't tell how much was taken in to be able to determine how much went into the hair. But now they're setting up a real measurable uh, system where you take in 50 milligrams, you should excrete 50 milligrams if you're not, um, you know, if you're, if you're not deficient. So I think that this test, obviously, that these physicians are recommending, is, has to be superior to a blood test. Now, I have not asked that of anyone, um, but I am assuming that they're using it on a regular basis. We're acquiring it, um, and that would be something I would, I would have Dr. Mead on to talk about. <laughs> if, if Why urine one. over blood? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, and the second, what was the second that. question? Is its depletion usually located in the thyroid? No, uh, de um, not uh, a clear qu question. But um, the thyroid, well, l let's put it this way. If you're ingesting less than 12.5 milligrams of iodine per day, then you don't have enough for all the, the, the places that the body needs to put iodine. And so... Um, then um, the thyroid is going to take the first amount. And that's why goiter stopped with a small 150 microgram dose because the thyroid takes it first. But then that doesn't leave any for the breast tissue. That doesn't leave any for the brain. That doesn't leave any for the skin or for the ovaries. And that's why the, the consensus is these diseases are escalating because of an insufficient iodine, there's only, it seems, enough to look after goiter, and even that's on the rise. I hope that answers that question. Right, that makes sense. So, so the thyroid gland takes precedence over the brain and over other parts of the body. Correct. Interesting. Okay, how about getting iodine from kelp and seaweed? Well, again, um, what, what I encourage people to do is test to see if your protocol is working. Remember, that's what a test is supposed to do. It's supposed to prove whether or not what you're doing is adequate. And so if you are ingesting seaweed, um, I mean, there's no question that the Japanese are taking in about 13 milligrams of, of iodine per day. But do you eat like the Japanese do, or are you just using a little bit of seaweed? You see? So um, again, I can't tell you whether what you're doing works. Do a test. In fact, I think every single person on this call should order an iodine uh, test immediately and determine, are you insufficient or not? I mean, my goodness, it has such a role to play. It's no different than D3. I think everyone on this call should be ordering a D3 test as well. The, these to the one is a, a hormone and the other one is a mineral. It plays such a huge role. Why wouldn't you do it? Goodness. If, if you're really interested in prevention, we're talking prevention here. Right. 
I, we don't want to get to intervention, do we, David? We don't want to be intervening <laughs> on a health issue. <laughs> We don't want to get there. That's right. We want to, we want to stay healthy so we don't have to. And I think I think especially after being on these webinars, I think people who are who are darker skin like me, uh, yes, even need to do that those the, the vitamin D test more especially because we are certainly at a higher risk of vitamin D deficiency than someone like you, Jackie. Correct. Well, absolutely. And you know, recognize the body's. Um, mechanism for stopping the conversion of vitamin D3 in the skin is tanning. So you've got the ultimate tan, you know, all of us are trying to get there. <laughs> but you're absolutely correct, you know, who should be testing these things? Well, and the other thing is anyone who lives, um, you know, past the 35th parallel, well, anybody who's north of San Diego ought to be testing for D3. And, and you know, to, to, to to restore our iodine and D3 levels is not a costly venture. We have a vitamin D3 spray that we advocate using that is uh, $20 cost, and it lasts for three months. Now, come on. <laughs> it's not even expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My goodness, I didn't, I didn't even realize it was that cheap. Well, and, and, you know, using a sublingual spray is the better way to, um, to take, uh, you know, vitamin D3 because it is a hormone. So, you know, either topically apply it to your skin like you do with the sun <laughs> or, or, or somehow you have to get it past the digestive tract. And so you want to miss that digestive tract if at all possible. Using a sublingual spray is superior to a pill. And when it comes to iodine... Um, the body utilizes it in the stomach. A lot of people who have digestive problems would benefit with iodine because it's utilized. Remember that one slide I showed of where it goes? It goes into the stomach. And so a lot of people who have stomach problems probably would benefit with iodine. Iodine helps to alkalize the, the body, by the way. And there's a connection with fibromyalgia. I want you to know, David, I didn't present all of uh, what I've learned out there, but Dr. Fleckis is doing a really major study with fibromyalgia and deficiency of iodine, and he believes there's a connection. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that. I mean, uh, fibromyalgia is, is, is many times is as a result of the internal environment, not not being. I mean, the the environment of the cells. Correct. Could, could there be an acidic uh, component to that? Well, they don't know the mechanism, but they do. Dr. Fleckis, I think he's had something like 10,000 patients that have, and, and he's running a huge study right now, and he believes that iodine deficiency or iodine insufficiency is one of the contributing factors. You give a woman um, iodine and her fibromyalgia pain seems to dissipate. So anybody who's on the call, if you have fibromyalgia, you need to test to see if you're insufficient. And again, I hope everybody's hearing correctly. We're not advocating that everyone go on iodine indiscriminately. You need to test so that you know how much to take, um, because the, the test will help denote that. Right. And then you monitor it. <laughs> it's with wisdom that we're doing this. Absolutely. And uh, along that line, Anita wants to know, is it necessary to test before we purchase the iodine? How much is the test? Um, the test in uh, Canada is $120. In the United States, it's 110 We have to okay. import them from the U.S. into Canada. And they're available on our website. That's probably the best $100 that uh, anyone would spend. Well, well, what I like about, in your case, is that people don't just test. They, they actually have the opportunity to have a coach or a consultant work with them through the entire process so that they're sure that their levels are are normalized and they stay normalized, right? Absolutely. And, you know, that's, that's um, when we coach, we, we don't charge for that uh, at all. And particularly for those people that um, come off of uh, Building Strength web webinars, we assume that the folks that um, are connected to you are very interested in their own health and want to move forward on a positive path afterwards. So absolutely. It's a free service. Um, avail yourself of it. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate that. As a matter of fact, you, you mentioned that thing about, uh, about our, our, our guests or our viewers wanting to, be, wanting to take charge of their health. Our presenter last night was so impressed with the kind of questions she talked about chemotherapy and, and the use of antioxidants, and she was so impressed with the questions that just kept on coming in. And she was like, your, your view was really uh, enlightened. <laughs> Well, absolutely, and I think we want to continue to be. Um, uh, nobody cares about our body like we do. <laughs> yep. So we yep. want to be yep. protectors of it. <laughs> yep, and now Charlotte Gibbs says, great call again, Jackie. Thank you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, we, we have a, um, a group of consultants and practitioners who are just awesome, and they, they've dedicated their their time to helping support other people, um, helping with their protocols and with their programs. So, and you know, the consultants that work with me all have experience in this because we're all on programs ourselves. Um, I, I probably should have shared about the, the one situation with my daughter who had fibrocystic breast disease. She's an RN. Um, she did an iodine test. She's also a lifeguard. In fact, all seven of my children are lifeguards. And they, you know, they work in a chlorine environment. And I, I really do believe that all of them are going to be iodine insufficient. But we tested Darla's, and she was. She went on iodine. I was talk, speaking to her the, the other day, and she says she has continued through her last pregnancy on iodine, and she has no fibrocystic breast. So the, wow. it's totally dissipated. And, you know, she says the bottle of iodine just goes on forever. One bottle of iodine lasts six months, and it's $50. So, again, it's one of those under $10, $10 a month kind of supplements, you know. Great investments. And, and, you, and you, you pretty much guarantee the, the, the quality of your supplements, don't you? Well, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, the, the top lab in the country that produces um, iodorol supply ours. So we, we try to get um, the, the best supply from the top supplier, if at all possible, and that's what we're, we've been able to do. Great, great. And someone is, uh, just mentioned that is, uh, she is actually Dr. Fleckers' uh, patient, and she's, she wants you to correct the spelling. It's F-L-E-C-H-A-S, and not uh, okay. F-L-E-C-H-A-S. <laughs> Okay. I guess she's very protective. Of I took it off of the well. I took it off of the iodine site. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's another one. Can you same same person asking a question? Can you share some of the symptoms that come from too much iodine? Well, again, you know, um, we can go back to that slide. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them are that funky kind of feeling. <laughs> um, just a second here. I, I, I'm, by the way, I, I made a mistake. I was looking at my other clock, which I hadn't changed the, the time on. I hadn't, I hadn't taken, turned my clock back on, my, on this clock. And so I thought we had gone on for two hours, but we actually... Oh, no. Oh, no. We're just an hour and a half here. <laughs> just. <laughs> okay. So I've got it up on the screen, if everybody can see. Basically, the, you know, if you, and it, would, it wouldn't be from too much iodine, it would be from spilling the other um, bromine and chlorine, all right? Um, although, um, now I didn't put anything on the slide about too much iodine, uh, did I? The body does, um, rids itself of iodine in the same pathways as it does bromine and chlorine. And, and fluorine. So, um, you, you know, again, one of the um, idophobic problems was that they felt that too much iodine caused thyroid problems and caused some of those things. These doctors believe that um, if, you, if you monitor and keep within the right amount of iodine, you're not going to have any of those problems because the, they believe the parameters are high. Probably not unlike vitamin D3. You know, there was a time when we were told that you could overdose with vitamin D. Well, now the parameters are up to 20,000 IUs a day and still no sign of overdose. Um, well, we, we've, had a, we, we've had an expert, an endocrinologist, 
day, he uses 50,000 a day routinely. Yeah. And so, so vitamin D is pretty safe. Correct. Um, when we're testing, I've tested a number of people with vitamin D that have tested out over um, the, you know, what we consider to, or what the lab considered to be a normal limit of 100. Um, and the doctors call that toxic, but I, we, we haven't observed anybody getting, you know, having tremendous toxicity from vitamin D. But again, I think that the more vitamin or the more iodine a person takes, the more likely they're going to spill chlorine and fast. So we, we monitor and we start out slow. So that would be the, the only negative that I would say is, is if you start to feel kind of funky and, you know, um, instead of sleeping well, have difficulty sleeping, instead of feeling well, you have that, you know, loss of appetite and so on, then you're detoxifying. I mean, Dr. Brownstein, in his presentation, showed a woman who had cancer, and her bromine detoxification was amazing. Her nails were yellow, and uh, I mean, she was, you know, really detoxing quickly, but he was trying to help her recover from breast cancer. And he, he now has many breast cancer patients that are using um, iodine. So I don't know if there's a... Uh, an over-the-top or not. He seems to think that the more he uses, the more it spills bromine. And he just makes sure that they have an adequate amount of vitamin C and that they do the salt, a little bit of salt. And of course, as I said, um, Dr. James Wilson, who wrote the book Adrenal Fatigue, really liked our vitamin C because we had added sodium to it. Instead of putting a cheap calcium, which most vitamin C manufacturers do, um, we bonded ours to sodium, knowing that the sodium iodide supporter was sometimes um, faulty because of too much bromine, chlorine, and fluorine. Is that too technical? <laughs> <laughs> it will do. That's why we need to get the tapes or the recordings. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think, it, you know, and you will make this one available for us uh, a will. fee? Absolutely. Yes, good. we will available for you and we'll let you know. All right, it, that's great. Excellent. Are there any more questions? There are a few more. Now, there are some questions that are, that are strictly medical. So, and Jackie, for those, you want them to email you directly, right? Yes, please. Yep. And you want to give them your, you need to give them your email Well, they can go on, to the help, go on to helpforhormones.com and there's a, a place to contact us and, um, and they can do that there. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Uh, can, can you recommend a water filter that removes fluoride and or bromide? Um, you know, reverse osmosis is probably going to be the best. Um, a reverse osmosis will do that. Um, and, and that's probably the better. You, you don't want to remove everything from your water because then it's valueless. But um, reverse osmosis seems to be a, the best system. Okay, great. Uh, who wrote the book Adrenal Fatigue? Dr. James Wilson. James I actually, Wilson. The, the seminar I heard Dr. David Brownstein at, I actually went to hear James Wilson. <laughs> and Dr. Wilson and I had this conversation going, and I, I looked over and I thought, oh, I wonder who that is. He's going to present next. Um, I guess I should get in there and listen. I saw that there's this big table of books. Dr. Brownstein's written about six books, and every one is worth it, I'll tell you right now. Um, wow. Anyways, um, and, and I did meet him. He actually palpated my thyroid. <laughs> oh, doctors, you know. <laughs> I'm standing there, and he's got his hands on my neck. He says, you have nodes, you know. And I said, no, I didn't know. He says, you need iodine. Get on iodine. <laughs> So I've had personal experience with Dr. Brownstein. <laughs> Delightful speaker. What a great presenter. And I, actually there is a, an available uh, presentation that I, I'm going to see if I can get it put up on one of my websites, maybe under iodine testing. Uh, we'll embed it in because it's a free thing that you can embed. And it, it was just a great presentation. Excellent. Oh, wow. These well, people sure. are so great. They're so free with their information, you know. It's just wonderful. 
Well, they wanted, they, they, they really wanted to see people get healthy. That's what that, that has been our, our experience with these webinars as well. I've been amazed at just how many people are willing to give up their information and to work towards it. I mean, it's one of our professors. He, he, he spends weeks ready for a webinar, and he doesn't get a single thing back from it. So I'm just, it's, just, it's just a testament to the fact that doctors really want to help. Well, and you know, I, I know for myself, you know, I prepared a hundred slides, and every one of them is brand new, David. <laughs> you know, and uh, sure, absolutely, we want we want to help as many people as we can help themselves. That is great. That is great. We really appreciate it. All right, someone says thanks for another awesome program. That's Cheryl says that. Uh, can we order your iodine and vitamin D three spray without taking the iodine test? Um, the the D3 spray I have no problem with. I, I really don't encourage them to order iodorol from our website. I mean, they can order it, but please, you know, iodine is something that I think that they should test first. Because, number one, the test will tell them how much they need. If they're very insufficient, then we start them a little bit higher up. And Dr. Mead has had put together a protocol for our consultants to use, and I think that it's always advisable to, to get a before and an after. Um, it, it, it also will encourage them to stay on whatever protocol is best for them. You know, compliance is everything, isn't it, David? In, in this field, you, if you know you need it, you'll stay on it. If you don't know whether, oh, well, you know, I went on it just because I heard this <laughs> webinar, um, right. not because I tested, I'm, I'm not for that. Right. Especially when the tests are available. These tests are gifts to us. Absolutely. Are we Absolutely. going to call it a night? Um, I'll take. One, I'll ask one more question. Again, there are a few more that are, I'm, I'm not too comfortable asking. So sorry about that, folks. Some of my good friends are asking some questions that I'm just not comfortable asking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, does, uh, here's this one. Let's, do, let's end with this one. Does a 50 milligram loading always leave the body within 24 hours, or does it take longer? Why does no. it stay up? Okay, go ahead. The, no, they've determined, they've done this thousands of times, and they've determined in a 24-hour period, this is what should be excreted. So they, they've got their reference ranges based on 24 hours. Okay. So why, why does it say stop taking iodine for 20, for 24 to 48 hours? Some even say four days. Um, because they don't want you to um, have an interference. They, if your body is full up, it'll hold on to it for that period of time. You add the 50, you should be, um, um, you know, no problem. What, what they don't want to see is overdose. Uh, for that test. Mm -hmm. So they want you to take, uh, it's the same thing with saliva. When we do a saliva test, we want, we, we know what to expect uh, from a 12 hour previous dose. 12 to 24 hours they, is the last dose. And we, we know what to expect. If somebody takes it too, too close to the testing time, we know it's going to exceed our, our reference ranges. And so it's the same thing with the iodine. If you take it uh, sooner than 24 to 48 hours, it's going to exceed our reference ranges. Got it. Got it. Okay. I mean, we do Excellent. have this down to a science, don't we? <laughs> it looks like it. Looks yeah. like it. And there are things. I tested seconds 24 hours after loading, and I tested 7 milligrams. That's what she said. I don't know. Thanks for asking. Well, my tell her husband. to email me. Tell her to okay, email then. me with her test results, and I'll be glad to go over them. All right, then. You know what to do. Yeah. I know where to go. All right, this covers uh, the rest of you. Uh, well, again, you can also type on our on our, our comment section as well. That's that, that's the safe, safe place to go, and Jackie can hopefully answer some of the questions as well. Uh, sorry, we couldn't cover all the questions. I apologize for that. Um, you, you know, I hope you and I hope you also understand my hesitancy about it. Jackie, you've been wonderful again, as always. 
Thank you so much. I know we'll be having you back to speak on the, the, uh, the cardiovascular system, right? The hormones on your cardiovascular health, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. And I'm also in the process of creating two newsletters, two new newsletters, one for men, one for women. So we'll be addressing hormone and heart health for both men and women on that call. Awesome. Awesome. That would be fantastic. Well, we always appreciate your working with us on, on these things and looking forward to more and more in the year to come. Very good. All right, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, folks, thank you for joining us. Be sure to join us tomorrow for Phil going to be speaking. It is very interesting. Far infrared sauna, and there's a lot of research that's coming out on that, especially when it comes to detoxification. So, sure to be on tomorrow. You all have a great night. God bless.